Welcome to Applied Mathematical Finance. So we started a new section. Yeah, We are still a little bit in our section on discrete term structure models, but we started discussing the calibration of the model. So a small recap. We already discussed here the choice of the initial condition and the choice of the volatilities, well, to some extent. So our three parameters are the initial condition, the volatilities, and the correlations. So we consider the form of the model where we split the factor loadings into a volatility parameter and a correlation parameter, which is a little bit better to interpret. There was the alternative form that combined the two into a factor loading, yeah? the Cholesky decomposition of the covariance matrix. And initial value was maybe clear. Uh, and for the volatility process, yeah, there was a very intuitive choice for some special versions of the model. For example, if you consider the log normal version of the model, then you see this is just a Black-Scholes model and yeah, you get some uh, condition on the sigma parameter if you like to, for example, recover uh, capillate prices by just setting our volatility function to the black implied volatility. So what, what we did so far was that we found yeah, very nice choices for the parameters um, to match given prices. So just set the parameter to the right value and you will recover the um, observed uh, market price. More uh, generally speaking, yeah, we already mentioned that calibration is how do we have to choose a model parameter to match observed market values. And in a more general case, this is just inverting this map, for example, by using a numerical optimizer that modifies the model parameters to say reduce some error between the product valuation and the observed market value, you know? so some optimizer. So it may be that there is no clear uh, analytic formula that we have to set the parameter to a specific value so that we have to um, optimize uh, the parameters. And for this, it is very important to understand which financial product depends on which parameter. Say, it could be that a financial product depends on all parameters. Yeah, of course, a caplet also depends on the initial value, but once the initial value is set, yeah, you could ask this question for the remaining parameters. And it also could be that uh, there is a certain parameter that influences the financial product very strongly. So then this is maybe the parameter you should choose to calibrate to that observed product. And my next section, so my section for today is uh, calibrating to swap chains. And this is now where calibration becomes much more interesting yeah, because there is no trivial uh, analytic formula that tells me choose the correlation in this way and you will match that swap chain. Yeah? So the dependency structure is more complex and I do not have an analytic formula yet. Yeah, We could later try to derive one. So let's discuss the calibration to swap chain in our discrete term structure model. So a model that models forward rate. First, let's have a small recap. So I would like to calibrate to a swap chain. So a swap chain is an option on a swap. And we could reinterpret this product is an option on the swap rate paid in units of 
the swap annuity. So what we could derive was that upon the exercise date of the swap chain, so let's say this is TI where the swap starts, uh, this is an option on the swap rate S of TI. Well, the swap rate, okay, of which swap, assume the swap starts in TI and then uses just our tenor discretization and it ends in TJ. So it's this swap rate. This swap rate observed at this exercise date. So it's an option, yeah, maximum of the swap rate minus K at zero. And then this is paid in units of the swap annuity. So I pay in units of the swap annuity yeah, of the corresponding swap that starts in TI and ends in TJ. Yeah, it's also the swap annuity that I observe in TI. So what I can do then is I can move to the annuity measure. I can choose the annuity as a numerator. So we move to the annuity measure, which means I divide by the numerator. So this part goes away. And I just have the expectation of the swap rate minus K and zero under the annuity measure, multiplied with the numerator, so multiplied with the annuity in zero. So I have an option on the swap rate. So you see, to value this financial product, all I need is to understand how this random variable here behaves under my model. So, and now we are talking about calibration. So what I want to understand is on which parameters does the distribution of this random variable depend? Yeah, recall the definition of the swap rate. So here is the definition of a swap rate. It's the value of the floating leg divided by the swap annuity. So you see there's the swap annuity again here. Yeah, or if you do not remember, that's the definition of the swap annuity. And the value of the floating leg is just valuing paying the forward rate. So we have here the forward rate LK. So it's the swap that starts in TI and ends in TJ. So the last period is from TJ minus one to TJ. So it's the forward rates from K equals I to K equals J minus one that enter into the definition of the swap rate. There's also the zero Cooper bond here and here, but the zero Cooper bond also just depends on the forward rates. And if it is the zero Cooper bond observed in TI, uh, it just depends on the forward rates starting in TI. So I have the same property here that the product starts in L equals I, and then it matures in TK plus one. So the last forward rate is from TK to TK plus one. So it is here the product from L equals I to K where the forward rate LL enters. So if you look closely, you see that only the forward rate LK, K equals I to j minus one enters into the calculation of the swap rate. The second important ingredient is that the swap rate is observed at exercise date of the swap chain. So it's the random variable swap rate is the stochastic process. The random variable is the stochastic process at ti. So this means all these forward rates that enter here are also observed in ti. Which means if I now ask what model parameters enter into the construction, you know, the simulation of this random variable, it is sigma and rho, sigma k for the forward rate LK, and rho k1, k2, correlations between two forward rates, LK1 and LK2, where the k is an index from i to j minus one. So only the forward rates LK, K from i to j minus one enter. Yeah, so this is because we have this product and this sum. 
And it is these model parameters observed only up to time ti. Yeah? So the stochastic process runs from zero to time ti, yeah? and then at time ti, my swap rate is fixed, so my forward rate is fixed, so I do not care what comes after ti. Okay, so this is now good to understand. You see that if you ask yourself which parameter should you modify or choose yeah, to calibrate the swap chance, it is only these parameters here that are a candidate for this. So there is a yeah, nice dependency structure. Also, another thing you see um, for the uh, caplet, it was just the variance of the forward rate, you know, Li, that entered, yeah, because the caplet just was a nonlinear function, the maximum, on the forward rate, Lk. Now it is a nonlinear function on this object here. This object is a sum of forward rates, but a nonlinear function, if it would be a square, it would contain all parts Lk1 times Lk2. So it depends really on the covariances. What you have here is that I just say it depends on the covariances of two forward rates Lk1 and Lk2 for yeah, K1 and K2 in this interval. Yeah? And if the K1 and T K2 is equal, then it's the variance. So I would expect that the swap rate, yeah, the swap chain depends on the choice of these covariances for these specific indices. We calibrated the caplets to um, by, by using the sigma parameter. So maybe you could think, okay, swap chain, I have two parameters, i and j, that enter into the swap chain. Swap chain, maybe it's nice to choose the correlation to calibrate to swap chains. Yeah? So then we have a nice hierarchy. Given the initial value, you choose the volatilities to match the caplets. Given then initial value and volatility, you choose the correlation to match the swap chains. Well, the thing is that we will not do this because there is another even more powerful trick. We can choose the time dependency of the volatility function to calibrate the swap chain. So I assume that the correlation matrix is given and fixed, and we will calibrate the swap chain by making a choice to sigma. So I will illustrate you that there is a very nice, almost one-to-one -one dependency structure of the value of a swap chain with starting point ti and point tj of the underlying swap to our volatility functions. So from the definition of the swap and the swap rates, it's obvious that the value of a corresponding swap chain, so with exercise date, yeah, exercise date is before TI, and periods from TI to TJ, consistent with our tenor discretization. So I have t periods Ti to Ti plus one, Ti plus one to Ti plus two, and so on. And the last period is Tj minus one to Tj. These are the periods of the underlying swaps. It only depends on forward rates Lk with this index set of T where the time runs up to Ti. Uh, so it only depends here on these forward rates Li to Lj minus one, where the time parameter is between zero and Ti. So I have a nice little figure here. So this is my swap. This is the start time of the swap chain of the underlying swap. This is the 
end time of the underlying swap. This start time is also the exercise date of the swap chain. So we exercise into the swap chain here. So the forward rates are now the forward rates from I to J minus one. So Li to Lj minus one. That built up the yeah, valuation formula of the swap at exercise time. So it's these forward rates that enter. Okay, but all the forward rates are fixed at time ti. So the sigma that enters, so this is here, the wiggling is the volatility, the sigma that enters is the sigma in the interval from zero to ti. Yeah, so this here is my sigma of t that enters into this forward rate, okay, and I marked i plus one. So it's the sigma i plus one, uh, sorry, two. I marked i plus two. So it's the sigma i plus two of t. I assume that the initial value and the whole correlation matrix is already fixed. Yeah? So I just want to understand now if these two parameters are already chosen, yeah? correlation has been chosen differently, yeah, or it's maybe given, we have chosen a one factor model. Yeah? Uh, how does the swap chain depend on the sigma parameters, so, so the sigma functions? To understand this, yeah, I mean, sigma can be any function, a parameterized function. To understand this, let's do a simplification. Let's discretize the function sigma, that it is piecewise constant on my tenor discretization. So I have here the tenor discretization, T0, T1, and so on. And I now like to discretize sigma as a function of little t to be piecewise constant on these intervals. So in other words, I now define a family of constant, a matrix. So this is sigma KL. Okay, so this is now my new model parameter. And sigma KL is the yeah, volatility that I get if I average the variance over the time, little t from uh, TL to TL plus one. So you see there is the time parameter, the time index L here. So I integrate from TL to TL plus one. This is associated with the forward rate k. So I integrate the sigma k of little t sigma k, k squared. Yeah, so I get the integrated accumulated variance. And then I um, average again over the time period lengths. Okay, so to get an um, average variance, uh, accumulated variance over that time. Okay, and, and I would like to have volatility, so there is another uh, take the square root of, of that quantity. So you could think if my model would, for example, be a log normal, yeah, this is like a Black-Scholes volatility for a specific time interval, uh, little t. Alternatively, you could say that the sigma function is assumed to be piecewise constant from the beginning. Okay, so then you have that in the interval from TL to TL plus one, yeah, for little t, the sigma k of little t is just the sigma k L. So I also assume that I have now a discretization of the volatility function. So I have now many volatility parameters. Yeah. So how many parameters do I have? I have parameters. In my swap chain, there enters the forward rate LK 
k from i to j minus 1. So I have sigma kl where k runs from i to j minus 1. For the time, little t, we have the observation that only the sigma before ti enters. So it is that the L runs from zero to I minus one. Yeah, L equals zero is the time interval from T zero to T one, and L equals I minus one is the last time interval from T I to T I minus one, uh, to, to T I. This is now the set of parameters that enter into a swaption on a swap rate where the swap rate starts in Ti, where the swap rate starts in Ti and ends in Tj and is fixed in Ti. Okay, so what is the dependency st structure? How does the product for capital Ti and capital Tj being start and end depend on these parameters. Let's build a matrix. On the top, we have our model parameters. On the bottom, I have the financial products that I could observe on the market. Yeah, first note, this is a triangular matrix. If you have a matrix where the rows are given now by the forward rates, which I have in my model. So the first forward rate that enters is the L1. Yeah. So I can skip the row L0 yeah, because L0 is already fixed. Then L1 is a forward rate that lies in the second period. So this is my forward rate from T1 to T2. Okay, so this is this forward rate. And it depends on the parameter sigma 1, i equals 1, for the time of t, t from t0 to t1. Yeah? So is this volatility that enters into this forward rate? So it is the time from t0 to t1. Yeah? So little t in t0 to t1 that enters. So it is the parameter sigma 1, 0 that enters. After that, the forward rate is fixed. So it is no longer existing, yeah? So for that reason, I have such a triangle matrix. So this point here always then marks the fixing of the forward rate. Up to that point, I now have my parameters. So I'm, I'm labeling here my model parameters K and L because we have two other indices, namely that for the swap rates, which is I and J, the swap rate that starts in TI and, and, and ends in T, TJ. So I have that my forward rate volatility, sigma KL is that for the forward rate LK, where the simulation time, little t, is in the interval from TL to TL plus 1. Yeah? So this here is, for example, the parameter for the forward rate L2. For the time, okay, the 1 here is from T1 to T2. On the product sides, we have swaptions. A swaption starting in TI, uh, ending in TJ. So a swaption, an option that exercises in TI. So this here is the exercise date. Uh, 
for an underlying swap that starts in Ti and ends in Tj. So the first swap will start in T1 and end in T2. There is no other product here because here we would have end date smaller or equal start date. So it would mean that the swap is either empty, yeah, the end date is equal to the start date, or uh, the start date is after the end date. Okay, so that, that does not make sense. So it's also a triangle matrix. There's nothing to calibrate um, in the upper part of this matrix, upper right part of the matrix. This swap here below exercises in T1. It has just a single period from T1 to T2. Okay, so actually it is a caplet and it just depends on the sigma one from T0 to T1. So I have that this swap here only depends on this parameter. So maybe I just mark this. So we have that this swap chain on this swap rate only depends on this parameter. Yeah, let's continue. So this swap he here starts in T1, ends in T3. So it is going back to the picture, a swap that has two swap rates. It starts in T1, ends in T3. It has L1 and L2, but the time only runs from T0 to T1. So it is the sigma one and the sigma two that enters because L1 and L2 from T0 to T1. So it's also only this, this column here. So this swap depends on these two model parameters. Next guy, let's look at this swap. It is a swap that starts in T1, ends in T4. It has three forward rates that it depends on, L1, L2, L3. So it depends on L1, L2, L3, but it fixes in T1, it starts in T1, so it only depends on the sigma from T0 to T1. So you see how this continues, this guy depends on these three sigma parameters here. Let's continue and look at this guy. So this guy here, is now a swap that has start in T2, end in T3. So it has just a single period, start in T2, end in T3, but the time little t now runs from T0 to T2. So it depends on one forward rate, only on T2. It starts in T2, ends in T3, but the time runs from T0 to T2. So it depends, yeah, it is a bit more complicated than you would have thought. It depends actually on this row here. Let's look at, for example, that guy here. That guy is a swap that starts in T2, ends in T4. So it starts in T2, ends in T4. So it has two periods here. So it's the forward rate L2, L3 that enters. So I'm here, L2, L3 that enter. And the time, it starts in T2. So the time runs from T0 to T2. So it's spanning from T0 to T2. So this guy on the bottom depends on these four elements here. But now you get the picture. It is always the block, the full block, starting in the corresponding row I, going up to the corresponding column J. 
Okay, so it is like a one-to-one -one relation, but you always take a little bit of the old values. And also now observe the nice thing. There's always one additional value entering. So there's always one additional free parameter. So I could calibrate this guy by choosing that one here. I could calibrate this guy by choosing that guy here, okay, because this is a new parameter. The other one is already fixed. I could calibrate this guy by choosing that one here. The other two are fixed. This is a new parameter. I could calibrate this one by choosing that one and this one by choosing that one. So there's always one free parameter that could, you could choose to match the observed product prices. So I have a very nice mapping from model parameters to products. And once the model parameter has been fixed, I can choose another one to match conditional that the other one have been calibrated to match this product. This is then just a set of one dimensional optimizers if you do it numerically. You know? So this is a very efficient method. And this method where you have multiple parameters, but where you can calibrate each parameter individually is uh, sometimes called um, bootstrapping. So here we have um, the algorithm. So you step through the starting times, T, I. Yeah? So you see, we stepped through the starting times here on the outside. And for each starting time, you step through the end time, TJ. So we see in the inside, yeah, we stepped through the end time. So you step for a given start T1 to all end times, and then you go to the next starting times. And then you can calibrate your model parameter sigma j minus one, i minus one, to the given swap rate option, uh, uh, where the swap starts in ti, ends in ej. Yeah? You can do this by considering that all the previous ones are already already fixed. Yeah, so sigma k l for k from i to j minus one. So the upper uh, row and um, rows and l from zero to i minus two is um, already fixed. You also see that this relation is um, one to one. Yeah. So you have here exactly the same amount of rows and columns. Yeah. There's just a little thing that here I start uh, counting uh, in, in zero. Yeah. It's from time t0 to time t1. Okay, so there's um, a small uh, shift. Yeah, and here you start uh, counting counting in two. Yeah? So, but apart from that, it's um, uh, one parameter for each product. Very, very nice um, algorithm. So it appears as if I can calibrate all the swaptions so all the products which I observe on my tenor discretization to just the volatility functions, my time um, uh, parameterized uh, volatility function. Well, what, what, what now about the caplets? We also needed the volatility function to fulfill the condition that we match the caplets. Well, the caplets are inside here. Yeah? You see that this guy here is the option on the swap that starts in T1 ends in T2. So this is in the picture, the guy that starts here ends here. Yeah, okay. And this one here is then starting one time step later. So it's starting one time step later and it ends also in the next time step. So these guys are just the caplets. So what you see is that on the diagonal matrix here, It is just the caplets. 
So our condition that the whole integral matches the implied volatility is contained here. And that's also the reason that I have to find these sigmas in this way. So you see, if you sum up all the sigma squared times time step size, uh, you are just getting the um, black implied volatility if it would be a block normal model. Okay, so this is really um, a very nice table. I can now calibrate all caplets, all swaptions by the choice of my sigma i um, of t, yeah, discretize the sigma k. Yeah. So I could use um, a piecewise constant volatility model and I can match all these um, options. So as I mentioned, this uh, method is called um, a bootstrapping. So it is um, the procedure that I incrementally uh, calculate an additional parameter of a piecewise constant sub uh, model. In our case, it is called uh, volatility bootstrapping. The disadvantage of the volatility bootstrapping is that we have a huge number of parameters. So if you have 40 years um, semi-annual yeah, or say quarterly, yeah, four periods a year, 40 years, 160 periods. Yeah, so you have this 160 square. Okay, one, one, one period is missing, 159 square matrix. Okay, it's just the half because it's just the subdiagonal, uh, the 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 um, lower triangle. But it is a huge um, amount of parameters. Yeah, or ten thousands of parameters. So there is overfitting, and of course, I do not observe all these um, swaptions. So um, what we could do to reduce the risk um, of um, overfitting, or even to just um, avoid the problem that my matrix is too fine for the number of uh, products that we um, observe, we could again reduce the number of parameters and instead of using my piecewise constant uh, volatility function, I could just um, use some functional form, some model, low parametric model for the volatility functions, and then use this, this trick here to, well, calculate or calibrate parts of the um, function more um, efficiently. This is an example of such a functional form. So to reduce the risk of overfitting, you know, so we may restrict the volatility functions to a parametrized uh, family. Here, this is, for example, a very popular low parametric family. So then my model only has five, sorry, four, four parameters. Yeah. So I have an exponential decay in the time to maturity. Yeah? So it's reversed parametrization of time. So only the distance of the maturity, the fixing distance to the fixing of the forward rate enters. There is some absolute level yeah? and there is some linear part. Yeah? Okay, so this form looks a little bit like that. You have here a linear part. So this is something like that. It's also parameterized backward in time. You have then some exponential decaying part. So somehow there is an exponential decaying part now towards some level D. Yeah? So this is a little bit like the um, model looks when this here is the maturity of the forward rate from Ti to Ti plus one. Okay, so you could use, for example, such a function form.
That was a first tour to um, the calibration of swaptions. I just studied now the dependency structure. So you could use this now to feed a numerical optimization algorithm. Yeah. So always have a one-dimensional numerical optimizer, yeah, like a Newton's method or um, a golden section search, a bisection, uh, to optimize one of these parameters to match the given swaption and then take the next one. I will return to swaption calibration in a later session where I try to find an analytic mapping yeah, between my sigma matrix and implied volatilities I observe on the market. So I try to do what we do did for the caplet, but there's a little bit, really a little bit harder, uh, which is then um, allowing us to calculate this matrix uh, analytically without a numerical method. 